Hi, welcome to We Won, Now What? This is uh, being presented for DEF CONF US 2020. I'm Ben Cotton. I'm here to offer some opinions to you for the next 45 minutes. So, start off with some boilerplate as I usually do. Uh, let's talk about it. I want to make this a thing that we can discuss. If you have constructive comments, you can at me on Twitter. You can uh, hang around for the Q&A afterwards. If you have non-constructive comments, you can keep them to yourself. So now, usually when somebody gives a talk, they have some disclaimers, right? So, you know, these are not my employer's opinions. These are not my project's opinions. I'm speaking for myself, blah, 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 blah. And that, that very much applies here. Uh, you'll see that I'm not wearing any brand of apparel, and that's for a good reason. Um, just pretend like you don't know anything about me or what I do for a living. Cool. But also, I have an unusual disclaimer for you that this might not even be my opinion. There are things in here where I'm not entirely sure I agree with what I'm saying, and you're more than welcome to also disagree with that. This talk is really about presenting some thoughts and ideas and a way to think about the future, not necessarily to prescribe a future. To that end, I have another unusual disclaimer. And that is, this talk, I think, will ask more questions than it answers. There is a question mark in the title of the talk. That should be your first indication. So, what's this all about? So this talk, uh, the idea came to me in the before time. This was October of 2019. I was in Raleigh, North Carolina for uh, OpenSource.com's annual uh, community moderator then now correspondent summit. And we were talking with Red Hat's uh, chief people officer, Delissa Alexander, about the history of opensource.com. The site was celebrating its 10th anniversary. And we were just talking about like, you know, look how far we've come in 10 years. Because 10 years ago, people didn't really understand open source, especially in enterprises. It was scary to them. And now it opens the default, like we've won. Isn't that great? So I asked her a question. I said, where do you see 10 years from now? What, what will this conversation be like then? What's the big difference? And my friends, I really wish that I had been taking notes or something because she gave an answer that I thought was really insightful and I have no idea what it is now. Sorry about that. But it did get me thinking over the course of the next few days, like, well, if we've won, like, what does that look like? What, now, what do we, where do we go from here? Like, once you've won, what else is there to do? So open is the default choice. Now, I present to you some evidence that we've won in case you don't agree. You might remember in 2001, Steve Ballmer was at Microsoft and he said, Linux is a cancer. And cancer is generally a thing people don't like. They don't think kindly of it. It's bad, right? And Balmer and others thought that the GPL was like a virus that infected uh, other software and that it would just destroy the way they viewed the world if it were allowed to you know, continue. And then in 2015, Microsoft loves Linux. So you might, you might not agree that Microsoft loves Linux. You might question their motivations, that's fair. Do they love Linux because they realize that Linux can't be stopped? Maybe. Do they love Linux because they realize they can make a bunch of money being supportive of Linux? Probably. Like, it, maybe it's not a profound philosophical realization, maybe it's strictly commercial, but either way, they're a huge contributor to Linux and open source in general now, and that's good. And I can tell you, from when, when I worked at Microsoft a couple of years ago, like they're sincere about it. They may not have the same motivations that all that others do, but they are legitimately loving Linux. This is not an embrace, extend, extinguish kind of situation. Uh, when I worked in the Azure marketing team, the fact that Linux v virtual machine usage was outpacing Windows that was a cause for celebration. We were graded on that. Like that was an important part of what we were trying to do. Now, granted, Microsoft is a, a company of 150,000 people. I almost said country, which 
I mean, it could be. Anyway, the, the love for Linux isn't evenly distributed within business units or even within, you know, individuals within ones that do, but it's there and it's sincere. Now, you remember, may remember in 2004, our friends at Canonical opened Ubuntu bug number one. Microsoft has a majority market share. That was a bug that they needed to solve. In 2013, Mark Shuttleworth left a very lengthy comment that you can't read, but it's just there for visual prettiness, basically saying, fine, like, this isn't what we need to focus on anymore. We're good. They closed it. Now, Microsoft still has a majority market share, but maybe we don't care as much. And, you know, for years, the year of Linux on the desktop was a big joke. And the year of the Linux desktop is here. It's called Android and Chrome OS. Like more people are using Linux today than we probably ever would have thought 10 years ago. They're just maybe not using a typical Linux distribution like we thought about. And, you know, open standards are being embraced too. Jack Dorsey uh, on Twitter was talking about maybe putting together a team of uh, engineers and stuff to develop an open standard for social media so he can decentralize it. Now, he got a lot of flack about this because, I mean, there are already open standards that are very Twitter-like that Twitter could just participate in. But, you know, his reasoning is email, for as much as we hate it, has worked really well ish for the last decades because it's built on open standards and you don't need to be on gmail to email another gmail user right you can email whoever you want which is both a blessing and a curse but jack dorsey says hey open this is good for my platform right all right so now what do we do that we've won well Unfortunately, we can't all retire to the beach as much as I would really love to just sit there with a bottle of whiskey and a stack of good detective novels and a big umbrella because sunburn. We can't do that yet. We're not there. But I got to thinking, you know, does the fact that we've won explain some of the tumult that we've seen in open source lately? So I developed a hypothesis that we're not actually going to test, but I'm just going to put this out here. My hypothesis is that open source contributors have agreed to an unspoken truce in order to defeat proprietary software. And now that we've won, we're able to resume our infighting. So what am I talking about here? Like, remember back in the day when people would get into fierce battles over which text editor was better? And the right answer is the one you're using is a good text editor. That's fine. But we spent a lot of energy fighting over this. We fought about which Linux distribution to use thought about which desktop environment to run, which license to use. And none of this really matters because people can use what they want. And that's one of the great things about open source is that there's lots of choices to choose from and you can go participate in whatever community you want and help make it more better. -er. And we kind of stopped doing that after a while. And maybe because we were focused on the outside and now we turning it back to the inside? So what am I talking about here? Well, one, maybe we're writing new licenses to solve old problems. It seems like more licenses are being submitted to the open source initiative lately. This is the body that defines what open source is. They have the capital letters open source definition. And these licenses are, aren't just people sitting there going, oh, I'm going to write a license because it's fun, which it is. But like, these are people getting actual lawyers to write licenses that people can actually use. And we're seeing an uptick in that. And maybe it's because they're like, oh, all right, now it's time to solve some other problems. Uh, one that was recently approved went through a very long process and got Bruce Perrins to quit the open source initiative because he thought the, they were heading the wrong direction. That was not minor news. But one of the things that we'll come back to a little bit later is this observation that data and software are merging. 
And we used to think soft, of software as this, this thing that was just sort of contained and off to the side, and that's maybe not the case anymore. So one of the, one of the other things that we're starting to see uh, for the, is typified by the Hippocratic license. And if you're familiar with the Hippocratic Oath, it's what doctors promise to do when they doctor, and it says, first, do no harm. So if you can't help the patient, at least don't make them worse. That seems like a pretty good thing. And the idea behind this license and others like it is that if I've put a lot of energy into making the software, I don't want it to be used by the bad guys. Now you can see where the difficulty is there is like who defines what the bad guys are. And I think most people who make tools of any kind, whether they be automobiles or software or firearms or kitchen knives or any other tool, they don't want it to be used for bad purposes. You want, you're making this thing because you want to make the world better somehow. But it's really hard to define that in a way that people can agree with. And frankly, it's not open source. Now, that doesn't mean it's good or bad. It just means that because it restricts the field of endeavor, it cannot be considered open source. Another problem that we've started to come up with is the, oh no, this isn't a business model. It turns out you can't just say, this software is open source and make a bunch of money off of it. Now, Red Hat has been extremely successful in producing and selling support for open source software to the tune of two plus billion dollars a year and then being the largest software company acquisition ever. That's good. Frankly, not a lot of companies have had that level of success. And I'm not here to say whether Red Hat has been good or lucky or both, but there's probably some of each. But it turns out that it's more than just being open to make money. And it turns out that if Amazon Web Services wants to take the code you wrote and make an as a service offering based on it, they're going to make a whole boatload of money and the license you chose doesn't obligate them to give any of that money to you. Now you can, again, make the case that ethically they are uh, you know, strongly encouraged to do that. They have an obligation there. You could certainly say from a business perspective, if they don't want to have to keep developing it themselves, it's in their interest to make sure that the upstream project is well-funded and viable, but there's no like real obligation for it, like no legal obligation. And so we had a few projects that just kind of wrote their own licenses that my interpretation of them is basically, you can use it, don't make Amazon Web Services out of it. And people were rightly like, okay, but that's not open source. You can do whatever you want, but don't call it open source. MongoDB, for example, had to be removed from the Fedora repos because the server side public license, not open source, so Fedora can't ship it. So we've won, but that's not enough because we're still, there's still problems for us to solve. But then maybe the question is actually, have we really won? What does it mean to win? What does winning look like? So the state of technology these days is a little bit of a garbage fire. We talk about the algorithm like it's going to save us. Like we can take this, this math and shove it in on some thinking rocks and save so much human effort and be more reliable and uh, not have to subject underpaid contractors to viewing all of the terrible things that Facebook makes them do to make sure it's not something that should be removed from the platform. And we can do all these things and make everything so much better and more automated and driverless cars. And yeah, the algorithm won't save us because it turns out the algorithm is only as good as the people that make it and the data that goes into it. So when there was an algorithm that helped determine uh, levels of healthcare, and what kind of healthcare treatments people receive, it turns out black patients got less from that algorithm 
because historically in the U.S., it turns out there have been some uh, some racial injustices and perhaps there's some biases in the system that we're perpetuating with that. So Amazon said, you know what? It's really a problem for us that we are not having the diversity in our company that represents the population at large. Right? You know, studies have shown that more diverse companies produce better results. So they had a secret AI recruiting tool that they were going to use to help screen resumes and get rid of bias, except it showed bias against women. Why? Because in technology, we have largely had a problem with bias against women over the decades. And so the algorithm has just learned from what we've given it. Face recognition software. Now, let's set aside the argument for a moment that facial recognition software not working is actually a good thing. Um, it's facial recognition is used for a lot of bad purposes by a lot of regimes around the world. It's also kind of useful. You pull out your iPhone, you hold it up like you're going to do anyway. You're going to put it in front of your face and it just says, oh, there you are and unlocks for you. That's kind of nice. But it turns out that facial recognition software works really well for white men and less well for others. And so let's talk about faces a little bit. Recently on Twitter, I saw a, uh, a project where they would take a pixelated version of a face and try and depixelate it with AI. So former US President Barack Obama is famously a black man. And when the his picture was fed through that algorithm, it uh, turned into some vaguely white dude. But it's not just him. Somebody posted a picture of his wife who is of Asian descent. And she turned into a vaguely white person. And so did actress Lucy Liu. Huh, this seems problematic. You know what's even more problematic? When the facial recognition algorithm says, that, that's the guy, that's the one who did the crime. And it turns out, no, it very much is not the one who did the crime. Reporters did some reporting, as reporters are wont to do. And they found out that in Detroit, the facial recognition error rate was 96%. 96. Now, I want to take a bit of a moment to take a detour, make this a little bit personal. My undergraduate degree is in meteorology, and weather forecasting is notoriously very difficult. Meteorologists have a reputation of being wrong all the time, and people are like, you can, keep your, you can be wrong 50% of the time and keep your job. That's awful. 50% of the time. 96% failure rate. 96. You could just guess and be better than that. So garbage in, garbage out became garbage in, garbage fire, but not necessarily on purpose. Like I'm not here to say that the people who wrote those algorithms or provided the training data sets are doing anything with malicious intent. I don't believe that's the case. I think they don't think about these things because they don't have to. That's what we call privilege. So now maybe the idea is we just need to be more aware of what we're doing and think about the ramifications of it. Because it turns out there are ramifications. So maybe what we need to do is not worry about winning, but just get better every day, right? Like wake up today and like, I'm gonna be slightly less bad than I was before. Woo, progress. I want to go back to Pam's comment on about the OSI mailing list and looking at the new model of licenses because I think it turns out that while we were focused on software, the data was actually what's important. And this is the part where I'm going to get a little spicy. And this is the number one slide where I'm not sure I agree with myself, but here it is. Free software is less important than reliable and protected data. Do you agree with that? I don't know if I do. Maybe a, a more agreeable way to say it is free software is a necessary but insufficient condition. Because all the things I've talked about with the algorithm and stuff, mostly these are done with proprietary 
algorithms or proprietary data sets. But being open source wouldn't necessarily fix that. It's not a magic balm that fixes everything. Data, uh, Facebook could open source their entire platform. They could have been open source from day one. And the data is still the problem, not the software. So let's talk about how some of the ways that data is the problem these days. Uh, for example, you have police databases that have all kinds of information about people. And I think most people would agree that there are at least certain cases where it is desirable for law enforcement to have access to information. I think we can spend a lot of time agreeing about where the boundary is and under what circumstances that's appropriate. That's another talk. But I think most people would agree that police officers stalking exes or crushes or romantic rivals or people that beat them up in high school or whatever, that is a misuse of it. There's a word for it that happens often enough. Here's something that's, a little, that's even more serious or perhaps serious in a different way. There was an app that was designed to help people who were in abusive relationships get the resources they need to get to a safe place to escape the relationship or you know, do whatever it is they need to do. This is very important information because if an abuser knows that someone is being, that the person they're abusing is trying to get help, that can make the abuse worse. It puts lives in danger. The app uh, had a little bit of a data breach and a whole bunch of information got out. This is life or death stuff, friends. This is not some hypothetical situation. This is putting real people's real lives at real risk. So, apart from protecting data, there's some other things we could be doing in the future, like fixing our people problems. So open source is growing, but not how it should. This is the title of a summary of the 2019 Stack Overflow Developer Survey. I'm going to show you a few charts from the 2020 version. We'll just think a little bit about what this means for ourselves and for our community. Race and ethnicity. Almost 69% uh, of respondents said they were white. Doesn't sound like it represents the population very well. Uh, 4.5 are black. That's certainly less than the population of the US percentage wise and well less than the global population. Now, this seems bad, yeah. How about gender? Roughly 90% of respondents were men. I am very sure that men do not make up 90% of the world population. Physical disabilities. I actually really do not like this graph because it doesn't have, I have no physical disabilities to scale it. But approximately 1.1% of respondents said that they are blind or have difficulty seeing. And it turns out that can be a problem because when you design your fancy new web page and it's got, well, not Flash anymore, but it's got like JavaScript you doing stuff everywhere, boo, 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 boo. screen readers have a hard time with that. If you have a bunch of emoji in your Twitter handle, screen reader is going to have to sit through and read out every emoji. And if I were blind, I would probably want to show up at your door and yell at you. For having 20 emoji that every time a tweet from you is read, I had to sit there and listen to each and every emoji. It's things like not including alt text on images and stuff like that. Like these are things where we're excluding people for no good reason. And I'll admit I'm very bad about doing alt text on images, especially on social media. I just don't think about it a lot of the times. And that's because I personally don't have to but that's bad and I should fix that and you should fix that. And if we had more people with physical disabilities represented in our communities, we would think about that more. And age. I am 37 years old and I am apparently ancient. Half the respondents, slightly more than half, are 30 years and younger. Old people 
have made a lot more mistakes in their careers generally than young people. When you're younger, you can make many mistakes more quickly, but when you're older, you get to learn how to make bigger mistakes. And this doesn't say that like, it's better to be old or it's better to be young. Like there are advantages to both. And frankly, if you're young, you're gonna end up old, uh, hopefully. But what kind of mistakes are we making that we could avoid making if we had people who had made mistakes like that before? So we have people problems. We have not enough contributors. Uh, most projects by and large would always like to have more people helping out in some fashion because there's always more work to do than there is time to do it. As we've seen, our communities are not representative enough. Like this is a problem, full stop. Heartbleed taught us that there's a lot of projects out there that power trillions of dollars of economic transactions every year that don't really get the financial support that they need. And they got like one or two people making pretty low end wages for technology, basically keeping the entire world's economy running. <laughs> that seems like a problem. And there's not enough user education. And what I mean here isn't just like training manuals and stuff. And it very much is not don't use this proprietary software. It's proprietary. Use the open source or the free software version because yeah. I mean, yes, but also nobody cares, right? It doesn't matter that you have a strong philosophical argument in favor of free software if you can't express it in a way that the person you're talking to is going to care. Because there are so many things in this world for people to care about, as we have learned in the past six months. There are so many things, and nobody can care about all of them. And if something just works for people and they can just do it, then they will. So you have to, we have to be able to explain to people in a way that matters to them why it's important to have software that they can see or that somebody they trust can see what it's doing, why the data collection and data retention and all of that matters. So where do we go from here? I don't have answers. I've given you some ideas of things we should think about, things that maybe we can improve upon, but there's a lot between here and there. And so I invite you to spend some time thinking about this. 10 years from now, what do you want the, this talk to be about? What do you hope that we will have fixed? Will we improve? What, what definition of winning can we set up and meet that goal and then move on to the next and the next? And we can iteratively, iteratively improve on ourselves as people and our society and our technology. So with that, I thank you for your uh, rapt attention. Everyone didn't even blink in the audience. That was great. If you have constructive comments, there's my Twitter handle. Again, non-constructive comments, you are cordially invited to keep to yourself and I will be available in the Q&A for further questions and discussion. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Questions? Comments? When I gave this talk at, uh, at DevConf Check back in January, I very cleverly filled the entire 25 minutes with talk. Um, so I didn't have time for feedback, so that was really great. But now I've left myself open to you. Sally asked where I'm broadcasting from. I'm in Lafayette, Indiana. And yes, Jason, I did put on a, a different shirt. I thought about like getting the the black t-shirt and the sport coat on again. I was like, eh, it's kind of warm. Uh, I, I believe the shirt is cotton, as am I.
Uh, oh, Jen asks, can I talk about what my vision in the next 10 years may be? Um, you know, maybe I should have thought about that a little bit. Um, I'd like to see a world where we're using our technology to make life better for people. And I think a lot of times we we think we're doing that, but we're very narrow in what we what we think about. And this kind of goes back to the the privilege thing I was talking about in the talk where we're not very good at thinking about how our work affects people who aren't like us. And if we can change one thing in the next 10 years, I hope we as an industry and as a, a species can get better at that. Langdon asks, what will make that happen? Um, boy, I tell you what, if, uh, if I knew the answer to that, you would be paying for my talk instead of um, hearing it for free. Uh, that's, I mean, that's a really good question. Um, I think in some ways bad things happen, happening can help make good things happen. Um, at some point, the the negative effects become too loud and too too hard to avoid, right? We can no longer pretend that we don't know the bad effects of what we're doing or what other people around us are doing. Um, and it really stinks for the people who uh, have to face the negatives in order for the positives to happen. But I think that could be a good driver. A uh, question is, do you see signs of that since open source has been around for a while? What I said about inviting diversity. Um, I feel like corporate backers of open source have done a really good job of talking about diversity for a while. Um, I don't necessarily see by and large communities doing a good job. Uh, I think there's more acceptance that we need to be more diverse and inclusive, um, but not necessarily a lot of um, large scale uh, improvements there. Uh, there are certainly um, programs that are doing good work. Um, Outreachy is one that comes to mind that I'm at least partially familiar with, but I think there's still a long way to go uh, very clearly. Um, do you find codes of conduct helpful are communities using it more diverse? I think they're helpful. Um, I think having a code of conduct at its core is defining what the bounds of acceptable behavior in a community are. Uh, if you were in Denise's keynote this morning, she talked about the, you know, we don't do that here. Um, I think a good code of conduct says what we don't do that here means for that community. And uh, how the community enforces those norms. Are communities using it more diverse? I don't know. Uh, anecdotally, I have seen people refuse to participate in communities or conferences or uh, you know other events that don't have a code of conduct. But um, you know, I, I don't know that there's been any real study about. Uh, you know, relative diversity on any axis between communities with and without a code of conduct. And that's partly because codes of conduct can vary pretty wildly. Um, and so it, you know, really, you kind of have to have a, the taxonomy of codes of conduct in order to start with. What program did I use to record? Um, so I recorded it with a, a handheld video camera on a tripod. And I used KDEN Live to edit it. Um, so I was, that's how I was able to composite the video and um, the slides. So I exported the slides to PNG files and then imported them and then was able to do the sometimes slide big, sometimes slide small and video and all of that. Um, I also used Audacity to do some noise reduction on the, uh, the audio. I tried to be as noiseless as possible. I had the windows closed and the air conditioning off uh, so it got pretty warm in there while I was uh, doing the recording. 
uh, but there's just, you know, traffic noise and stuff. So I tried to edit that out. Uh, another question. Do you know if there's any work going on in trying to bring down the huge error rates, like the 96% failure rates for the cameras in Detroit? Um, I'm not specifically aware of those, but oh my gosh, I hope that somebody is working very hard on that. Uh, because, you know, that's, we can't claim to have a justice system where we're misidentifying people 96% of the time. And, you know, like I said, it'd be much better to just scrap that entirely. Um, you know, the, the, the question is, you know, what are the incentives? I think it was Jen that made a comment about, you know, Microsoft embracing open source uh, in the interest of money. And I think a lot of the vendors of this kind of um, product as long as somebody's willing to write the check for it, they don't necessarily need to worry about how good it is. Um, and so I think from, you know, from that perspective, the pressure really needs to come from the public onto their officials uh, elected or otherwise to really um, step that up. I don't think the industry itself has much, in, much motivation uh, to fix that beyond, um, you know, the ethical, uh, work of certain individuals. Langdon asks, um, have you ever heard of a Hippocratic oath for software devs? Um, apart from the Hippocratic license, no. Um, there are a lot of organizations that have a code of ethics. Um, I know the Association for Computing Machinery, the ACM has one. Uh, the League of Professional Systems Administrators, LOPSA, has one. Um, you know, there are a lot of organizations that, you know, that have something like that. I think part of the problem is that even when they exist, we don't necessarily know how to apply them. Um, and there's a, there's some good books that have been published in the last few years about, you know, including ethics as a, you know, an active part of you know, curriculum, whether it's in coding boot camps or computer science programs or things like that. Uh, you can, you know, you can get four, years or, you know, even get a PhD in computer science and have never taken an ethics class. And so I think a lot of times we just lack the framework. Um, and then, you know, people who have come into it from other fields or just, you know, sort of start dabbling and fall into technology by accident, we don't have the theoretical framework to apply uh, some of the ethical principles. Yes, I am also not sure why you can get out of high school without an ethics class, but um, nobody has asked me to design state graduation requirements yet. Uh, this is more of an awkward silence than a pregnant pause, I think. One of the interesting things about uh, you know, vir the virtual conference idea and having the, the chat you know, here is that usually at conferences you know, during the Q and A you have the comment disguised as a question, and here it's okay because you can have the comments off in the chat, and the uh, the presenter can feel free to let the conversation happen, but not um, people aren't going to get up and monologue the Q and A. Sally said, "Awesome talk, Ben," and I will point out that that is not a question. But thank you, Sally. I think I have, what, five-ish minutes left. Um, so if there are other questions in the next few minutes, feel free to pop up. Otherwise, um, I had my Twitter handle. I'll drop that in the chat here in a minute, or I'll be around uh, through most of the rest of the day so you can find me in the, the hop and chat. It seems like we've exhausted the questions, so do want to thank everyone for coming and 
having a great conversation in the chat, uh, both during the talk and in the Q and A. It's been uh, really fun to to watch the feedback in real time. You don't usually get that kind of that degree of um, richness in an in person presentation. So I think I will go ahead and shut off the video, and I will hopefully see all of you around the rest of the day. Thank you.